Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kelly here with Esri and I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today. So today we're going to be discussing what's new in ArcGIS Maritime with S57 and automation. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our presenter today, Craig Green. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everybody. My name is Craig Green and I work on the Maritime Development Team. And I'll be presenting on three main topics today. Uh, most of today's focus is going to be on migration of the S57 uh, electronic navigational uh, chart capabilities into ArcGIS Pro. Uh, that's because initially five years ago, we were expecting people to migrate to S100 as they migrated from ArcMap to Pro. But it seems clear that uh, S57 is still going to be around for a long time uh, before S100 is fully adopted. So as a result, we've spent the past two ArcGIS Pro releases migrating our S57 support uh, from ArcMap into ArcGIS Pro. However, today we'll also talk a little bit about some updates to parts of ArcGIS Maritime Server, uh, specifically with the custom chart builder uh, application, which used to be called Pod or Products on Demand, uh, and its ability to leverage custom uh, paper chart symbology. So uh, it, it now has the ability to, to replace the S52 uh, Actus presentation library symbology with your own custom symbology. So uh, think N1 or S4 paper chart symbology. And I'll also provide a quick update uh, on some work in machine learning and AI that relates to maritime and also point you to uh, a webinar that's coming up uh, that will be entirely focused on on that subject. And as, as Kelly mentioned, I have uh, my colleague Steve Snow on the chat. So at any time during the presentation, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. And that way we'll have them uh, queued up at the end. So when, we talk, when we're talking about uh, SOT7 and ArcGIS Pro, a couple of things I want to highlight are the, what the architecture looks like in ArcGIS Pro. So a high level overview of what it looks like. Um, um, and if you're familiar with what the S57 support looks like in ArcMap, we can also talk a little bit about how it's different in Pro from ArcMap. We'll talk a little bit about the user interface itself uh, and how the tools to support S57 are essentially embedded in the Pro interface. Um, and a lot of what you can do in the interface can also be automated because we take advantage of geoprocessing tools, which of course can be scripted or put together a model builder and run a scheduled task or run completely uh, outside of the desktop application. And then also something that's new that's coming out in uh, the, the, the upcoming release in May is uh, enhanced support for the IHO or International Hydrographic Organization's S58 validation uh, and its integration uh, integrated validation that was not even available uh, in ArcMap. And I'll also do a quick uh, demo of, of some of these things so you can see what they look like. So a quick look at the architecture in ArcGIS Pro, it's really just one geodatabase. And we call that geodatabase the NIS or Nautical Information System. And that one geodatabase contains all the metadata about your products or all the products for the S57 products. It contains the footprints or the M covers, if you're familiar with that, or areas of interest. And it contains all the data, so nav aids, depth information. Anything you need to generate S57 is contained in this single geo database, which is one way in which ArcGIS Pro support for S57 is different than it was in uh, ArcMap, where the areas of interest or the footprint polygons and the metadata were stored in a separate geo database. Now, this geo database can be just a local file geo database. It can be an enterprise Oracle or SQL, SQL uh, relational database implementation. It can contain, you can just import one product into it or create one product in it, or you can have thousands of S57 products in it. It's, it's really meant to be any scale. If you take advantage, of course, of a multi user environment, you may want to work in edit versions or check out replicas, as we call them, um, which is just a local file geodatabase copy. So that is similar to workflows in ArcMap, where you can define, even though this central database may contain hundreds of S57 products, you can just check out one of them to a local file geodatabase 
as a unit of work, essentially. And you can export to S57 from that local file geodatabase or from this central database. And then additionally, uh, we'll be releasing a couple of workflows. So if you're familiar with uh, Workflow Manager, uh, we will release. Now, these aren't you're not required to use Workflow Manager in order to use the nautical uh, information system. But we will be providing four basic workflows out of the box that allow you to be able to create a job or a unit of work. And you can attach files to that job. So you may have some supplementary information or notices that go along with a specific job or task. Uh, it allows you to then uh, create either an edit version off of this relational database to be worked in, or it allows you, it creates a checkout replica for you. Uh, and then there's a quality control task before the data gets checked back in. So with those four basic workflows, you can plug those into the production manager, which is a web application front end that allows you to have a, a production manager role or person who can, based on your, your um, job AOIs, which could be your product footprints, create these, these jobs in a web application. Additionally, using the S57 metadata, the additions, updates, uh, last updated information, the footprints. Um, you can easily publish the information from your NIS along with the job information like the status of a job from your workflow manager database. And you can build dashboards that can be used to provide uh, up-to-date information to your stakeholders and users through web apps without them uh, needing to connect to any desktop applications or have any desktop uh, software. And then of course, um, at some point in the future. So these are all things that are uh, associated with the upcoming May release, um, but still in our future roadmap is traditional uh, paper chart production uh, in the desktop off of the nautical information system. So what does the user interface look like in ArcGIS Pro? Um, it's If you've seen ArcGIS Pro, you know that it's got more of a ribbon and tabbed style interface uh, that that is context sensitive. So an example of that might be that if you click on a layer, uh, tabs that are relevant to layer properties like labeling or the appearance of a layer appear. And if you click off of a layer, those tabs disappear. And it's meant to provide a cleaner uh, user interface. One of these tabs that you'll see if you have, and it's a context sensitive tab, is the maritime tab. So if you have maritime data in uh, ArcGIS Pro, it's recognized and you'll, you'll get this uh, maritime tab. Another um, difference between Pro and ArcMap is that in ArcGIS Pro, maritime is inside the core product. There's no longer a separate install for maritime. It's just part of what you get with Pro. And this has allowed for much greater integration into core functionality and interfaces. And one good example of that would be editing attributes. Uh, in Pro, there's only one dialog for editing attributes. And if you're editing mar maritime data, Pro natively understands this and provides an organized display of maritime attributes in the core attributes pane. So there's no need to learn a second set of dialogs or interfaces that are just specific to maritime. And again, of course, most of the capabilities that we have uh, are available as geoprocessing tools. So you can publish them as geoprocessing services or you can run them in batch and again, uh, string them together with, with other tools. So basic functionalities like importing data, exporting data, uh, creating exchange sets, doing validation can all be done uh, at, through geoprocessing tools. So one of the big things that we're put into this release is really thorough uh, data validation and much more integrated data validation than, than you would have found in, in ArcMap. Now we still have validation through geoprocessing tools that output shape files and a human and machine readable XML that can be leveraged with the data reviewer. Uh, we also have now uh, attribute rules that are rules that are stored on the geodatabase that perform on the fly validation. 
So all mandatory attributes are covered by this uh, on the fly validation and and the on the fly validation in pro is much more complete than it was uh, in in ArcMap. So in ArcGIS Pro, what you'll see is if you have invalid attributes, there'll be a little red tab next to them. Uh, if you change them to a valid attribute, it'll change to green. Um, and what's something that's brand new in Pro is this idea of having rapid uh, validation of an entire chart, electronic chart, or just a custom extent uh, of a chart so that you can validate an area where you might be editing and get the results back in the user interface. Uh, really quickly. So I'll first go through here and we'll do, let me bring up ArcGIS Pro here. And you can see I have a project here with some maritime data. One of the first things I wanted to show you is, as I mentioned, in case you haven't, aren't familiar with Pro, just the concept of the context sensitive uh, menus and tabs. And an example of that, as I mentioned earlier, is if you just click on a layer, you'll see tabs related to layer properties appear. So layer transparency, uh, labeling properties will appear. And if you click off of a layer, those tabs will disappear because you don't need them because you're not interacting with layers. So this is also true for maritime, as I mentioned. If you have maritime data in your map, you will get a maritime tab. And taking a look at some of the, um, the tools along the tab, if you're familiar with ArcMap, you're gonna be familiar, or even just probably familiar with SFD7 data in general, a lot of these things are gonna make sense to you. Uh, for example, there's the concept of a compilation scale. Because the nautical information system is a multi-scale database and it can hold any scale of data in it, you need to tell it what scale you wanna be working in so that any feature you create will be created at that scale. In this case, we're editing, you know, one to 52,000 scale data. We also have the concept of the relationship manager, which is a tool that manages uh, collections and structuring equipment type relationships. Uh, we have some quality control tools in here that users requested that we bring forward into Pro. So these will be available in the May release. Uh, so that if you, when you edit features, they automatically become unverified, which then if you use this tool, you select them all and you know exactly what was modified in the data. And you can queue those, that list of features up and step through them to see what's changed. And we also, this was a, there was a, this concept of just viewing a single scale or multi-scales of data. This was an add-in in ArcMap and we've just brought it into the core product in ArcGIS Pro. So if you, again, if you are looking at multiple scales of data, you can quickly set um, definition queries on all the layers uh, so that you only see one scale or only see two scales or, or whatever you just want to look at. As I mentioned earlier, one of the new uh, functionalities in, in the May release, which is ArcGIS Pro 2.9 or 2.8, is the S57 error manager. So what you'll see at the top is a list of, of geodatabases. And as long as that geodatabase has a data set in it, and this is the I, one of the IHO uh, ECTIS test data sets called Mickelfirth, if you're familiar with it. So you could, if there were multiple products in here, you would see a list of all the products. This list is dynamic based on your extent. So if you pan and zoom, you'll only see the products that are in your visible extent. And you can choose to validate the current extent or the full product. And when you validate this, it essentially runs through, generates an S57 data set, runs that S57 data set through the IHO S58 uh, validation checks, and then provides a list of the results. Now, if you only want to look at, um, if you want to hide certain types of errors, like maybe you only want to look at critical your critical errors, you can just filter those quickly. Um, you can, when you click on a certain type of error, you'll see a description, and this comes directly from S58, telling us what the error is. So here we have two MQAL meta objects overlapping. 
I can see that there are multiple instances of this and you can turn them on. So you may, I don't know if you saw, cause it was, um, it's just small. So we'll zoom to it. So we can zoom to the error geometry and there you can see where we have two metadata areas overlapping. So if we quickly fixed this area over overlap and ran that again, you wouldn't see that error. So this provides a quick and easy way for you to go through, validate all of your errors um, before posting your data back in. And you can be really confident in a really nice, simple workflow that you've got uh, all of your errors fixed. You can also see information about the features at the bottom. If you feel, if you're satisfied that you fixed an error, you can mark it as complete or you can mark a whole set of them as complete uh, as well. And if you need to get back to the extent, so if you validate it on extent like I did, and you want to get back to that original extent, you just click on zoom to extent. And that way you can continue to validate the same extent over and over if you were focusing on a specific area that was smaller than an, an entire data set. Okay, so that's a quick look at what um, S57 looks like in ArcGIS Pro. And again, these func this functionality that you saw today will all be available in uh, early May in the ArcGIS Pro 2.8 uh, release. So now I'll talk a little bit about ArcGIS Maritime Server. Um, some things about ArcGIS Maritime Server, in case you're not familiar with it, it allows you to publish your S57 or S63 data sets as REST or WMS uh, services, essentially, so web map services. It has um, an application that comes with it, so a web application. Uh, there's one that's JavaScript and one that's using the web app builder widgets interface that has provides ectus like controls over that data so you can essentially simulate the ectus experience in a web application directly from your s57 data now there will be a uh, a webinar coming up in august that covers this product um, the entire product and all of its updates uh, so i would encourage you to attend and look for that um, webinar that will be coming up on August 3rd and 4th. Um, but the focus of today's uh, webinar as, as it relates to ArcGIS Maritime Server is on the Custom Chart Builder app, which again used to be called Pod or Products on Demand. And really what we're focusing on here are a couple things, and one of them is the, uh, the ability to generate uh, customized products. So customize whatever data you want in it, customize the extent, the scale, and also fixed products. So where all of that is predetermined, uh, you can't pick whatever data you want and you can't pick whatever scale you want. You can only pick from a certain list of scales. Uh, this generates the PDF charts directly from that S57 data. So we'll be talking about some of the updates there and I'll show a quick demo of this uh, custom chart builder application as well. So if we look a little bit of the history of the custom chart builder application, the issue why we came up with this is because the issue we hear a lot over the years has been, you know, making paper charts costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. The use of paper charts is slightly going down, but it's still necessary. And it's still the logical backup to an electronic system in case the electronic system fails. So understanding that hydrographic offices and national mapping agencies and navies that are required to make these products are primarily producing, for carriage requirements at least, the electronic navigational charts. They're also increasingly asked to provide more products, so S100, of course, uh, data services, uh, marine SDIs. So they're wanting to know how they can reduce the cost uh, of, and they're struggling to justify the cost of the paper product lines given it's moving to a backup role to the electronic chart. So what we, you know, our answer to that was basically using that maritime chart service, so publishing the S57 data that generates these REST um, OGC WMS services. And, but the, that is traditionally it's bound by S52. 
which is the ECDIS presentation. So that really, you know, wasn't quite what people were looking for when they were looking for paper chart symbology and more of a paper chart feel. And also a lot of the other information that's contained in paper charts, it's accessed in other ways than in ECDIS. So how do we resolve those elements? So the first thing we did was really a simple thing, which was allowing support for custom colors. So you could replace the S52 colors with your own custom chart colors. And then additionally, around that same time, we released support for int one compass rows. So if you have the MAGVAR point features in your S57 data, when you render them with this custom chart app, they can be uh, presented as uh, a compass rose, a paper chart compass rose. Then in the next phase, we uh, added explanatory notes. So notes that are related to a specific chart that you're creating, since not all notes go on all charts. And then also, again, at that same time, we really support for ZOC diagrams. Now, this is a modified ZOC or zones of confidence diagram, as you can see, it doesn't use the traditional magenta dashed outlines with the number for the lettering scheme with A1 quality of surveys and B and C and U. Instead, it uses color. And the reason it uses color is because it's easier to make a small chart without text on it and use color to convey the information. Uh, and you're, you don't have to do any cartographic finishing that way. This is all configurable. Any colors you want to use in that, we just used what we thought looked good. Um, but all, all of the colors are, of course, configurable. And then after that, we, um, which I'll show today, we added mashup or the ability to add data. So you can add any uh, services or other data you want to your electronic chart data and turn on and off specific layers in the electronic chart data to use other information instead. So kind of getting into almost a feel of what S100 is going to look like as you mash up bathymetric data with traditional electronic dark data. And then also, again, we have this concept of fixed products uh, because if you are letting people add whatever data they want and move the chart wherever they want and make it whatever scale they want, it makes it harder to control the output. And so what a lot of our users asked for was the ability to tightly control the output where users can only select a specific so in this case you can only select one of the red squares you can't make a chart anywhere else and you only have a list of specific scales you can't pick whatever scale you want and that allows them to more tightly control the output now what will be coming out in the 10.9 release which is also uh, at the same time as the arcgis pro 2.8 release they're both currently scheduled for very early May, is custom symbology. So now you can, you can use Lua, which is a scripting language that is, can be embedded inside of other applications. So it's not anything Esri came up with, it's an open source uh, language and application that we're leveraging, where you can write rules to override and use any kind of symbology you want. So in this case, you're actually looking at S57 data where we've replaced the traditional cairn symbol with the int one we've we've replaced the nav aid and the top mark and the and even the reef outline symbol with paper chart symbology but that is directly from s57 uh, with no cartographic finishing so you can create your own uh, um, adobe svg symbols and swap those out uh, and, and have this custom symbology So now let me give you a quick uh, presentation of what this looks like. So again, uh, if, if you're using the mashed up, mash up version, there's two versions of this app and I'll show both of them to you quickly. This allows you to make quick charts with um, a variety of data sources. So in this case, I need to create a chart that's fit for a specific um, mission that that is not just um, on water but it's also on land and of course we all know that the that the data and a lot of charts many of them are supplemented with additional topographic data but some of them don't have the kind of topographic information you would need uh, if, if your mission spanned sea and land 
So what this app allows you to do is you can pull in additional services and add those. So I can get much better topographic data from the USGS than I have. So you can, now this is the, this is the default name of the S57 service that comes with ArcGIS server, but it can, it can be renamed. So these are all the S57 groups, right? So I want to use the topo, but just on LAN. So I can move that up, my ENC data. But since I have new LAN information from USGS, I'm going to use that. Now, additionally, um, maybe I have really, really up-to-date uh, bathymetric uh, information. And in this case, I'll, I'm pulling in a service uh, from NOAA of their bathymetric attributed grid data. So again, I, I don't want this to bury all of my chart data, so I'm gonna move this one down, but I'm gonna swap out my depth information for that updated bathymetric attributed grid information. And I think this is where you really start to get a feel of what S100 is going to be like, where um, of course it should be more dynamic, where the Actus knows that if you have S102, you would be swapping out the depth of information for the S102. But with services, using these open standards, you can really start to see how agencies can produce these REST, these OGC WMS services, and they all can play together in these kinds of ways. So now that I've got what I want, I can pick whatever size you know, scale chart I want on whatever size sheet of paper I want, portrait or landscape, and just insert that. And essentially what's gonna happen when I go to insert it is a geoprocessing service kicks off in the background and tells, says on an ANSI D size sheet of paper, it's portrait a one to 25,000, you know, how much surface of the earth is that going to cover? And then you can move it to where you want it and then you can print it. Now this printing, it does take probably three minutes, I think, so I'm not gonna bore you with making you watch it. I already did this once before so that you can see the output. And that's because this is the mashed up chart. So when you're adding a lot of services, it can take a little longer. In the fixed product where you can't, the, the exports are, are quicker. But here you can see the ZOC diagram. You can see the chart. You can see the int to grids and graticules and all the marginalia that was updated on the fly based on my inputs. And you can see all the explanatory notes. They're specific to this particular chart or where I created this particular chart. Now this is available from, this is available to the public. This is actually the app I just was showing you. And it's available to the public from this link right here. And there's no login required or anything. So we're not tracking you. So you can just go here and, and use this and, and create these apps. Another one that you'll see here is the fixed charts version. And so this is, I just wanted to show you this quickly so you can see what I meant. You can see there are not options, additional options. Users can only pick specific scale products and there's only a couple scales they can pick from. One of the things I wanted to show is some early uh, phases of this symbology here where you can see, go to a place where I know there's a few nav aids here. And you can see here that we that the nav aids, the old S52 nav aids have been replaced by int one uh, nav aids. Now at the at the time of the release for um, 10.9, this both this application that I and the other one that I was showing you earlier, uh, they will both be updated with the full custom symbology. So as much of the int one or S4 symbology as we have complete will be released in both this app and in this app at that time. All right, so one other thing I wanted to touch on was what we've been doing in, in deep learning. And we've mentioned this last year that the first part of this was completed already. And the first part of this was essentially the ability to take a new survey, use Esri's deep learning tools, uh, to find shipwrecks in the survey data. Now, this was released um, 
through the ArcGIS API for Python. There's a GitHub repository that has the sample data and the scripts that you need to be able to take. Uh, what we did was we took bag data when we used uh, fed this through a machine learning algorithm and trained it how to find shipwrecks, essentially. Now, the second half, that's what we did last year. The second half of this, we completed this year, which was essentially taking the results of the deep learning, finding the shoalest point within this observation, and writing that shoalest point along with the Z value to our maritime database as a rec object. Now, we didn't do anything special like we could have said if the rec is, if the you know, Z value is deeper than a certain depth, maybe you don't care about it for safety of navigation. We didn't do any of that. All we did was capture the Z value, write it to the value of sounding for the rec feature, and write that as a rec feature to the S57 database, and publish that through ArcGIS server as a web map. Now that is also available. You can go see the results of this, um, as well as the data that was created out of it through a link in that very same application I just showed you, which I'll give you provide a link to at the end. Now something else we started looking at using deep learning for was coastline detection. Um, and in the end, it ended up being something that we really could just use imagery classification for. Um, so it didn't end up being a target for deep learning. It ended up being something, again, we're using image classification for. So we, we wanted to have some kind of benchmark as what to look at uh, to see what would, you know, what do we need to compare it to. So we took some 1 to 60,000 scale uh, ENC data and took the coastline out of it to see sort of where it lined up with what type of imagery. And this really wasn't to say or see that the existing data was bad or wrong. We, we needed a baseline to check if we could get even that close against. So we, this is, these are the results from classifying the imagery and determining the difference between land um, and water. And you can see here that it's not, I wouldn't call it better or worse. There's things that are captured in the S57 that clearly look like there are hydro features here that were not captured. And in some cases, this looks a little more thorough, um, just different results. And I guess the idea here is not maybe for perfection, but how much can get done automatically to, to save some time for the manual uh, cartographer or data compiler. And you can see here, this, this represents the extent of where we were uh, performing this analysis. And then lastly, of course, given better imagery, we got better results. So this uh, was using Sentinel-2 data, this second image. Now, I'm not going into a lot of detail here. This will be covered in another webinar. Um, and perhaps my colleague Steve can paste a link to that webinar in the chat for you all. But there's a couple options there where they will cover both what I talked about on the previous slide, which is how we've sort of completed the shipwreck detection work and been able to automatically write that out as new S57. And then they'll also get into detail of what they've done here. And there still is another application that we're looking into for deep learning here, and that is the coastline classification. So now that we know we can find the coastline, we want to see if we can use deep learning to classify the category of coastline. So is it rocky? Is it sandy? Is it marshy? Uh, those types of things. So I do encourage you to sign up for that webinar if you're interested in uh, learning a little bit more about these uh, applications of, of deep learning in, in maritime, both the shipwreck detection as well as the uh, coastline uh, detection, which we think can be valuable for things like change change detection, in addition to other mapping needs. So some key takeaways here um, are that we continue to push our uh, the formerly products on demand, currently the custom chart builder application, as the next generation of chart making capabilities. Uh, we really need to, we've done a lot, there's a lot of new functionality in the last couple releases. And one of our goals really is to just help our customers migrate to, op to sort of adopt this new custom symbology 
um, and it, it, it just further expand our coverage of the S4 and INT1 SVG symbols. We will have a robust sample of INT1 symbols in 10.9, but we won't have everything covered yet. And also for the rest of the year, there's there will be two ArcGIS Pro releases. So this first one in 2.8, I showed you most of the new capabilities that are gonna be available there. And then for 2.9, we'll be putting the finishing touches on our S57 support with things like the automated generation of depth areas, the automated generation of land areas, and the automated cleaning of unnecessary nodes or overly dense vertices in data, because that's something that we see a lot as a problem from customers. Sometimes they're not controlling the data that's coming in, they're receiving it, and that data might be overly dense. Um, so looking at ways to kind of automatically clean that up. And of course, we're continuing to look at ways in which we can leverage deep learning. Um, and sometimes you think you're gonna use deep learning and you don't, but still it's, it's good, good progress. So again, this is the website uh, where you can, again, no login is required and you can um, see the applications and use the applications yourself that I showed tonight in the demo. There is the, also, as I mentioned, there's an app for the GeoAI shipwrecks. So it has the bathymetry layer, it has the existing S57 data in it, uh, and it has our output um, of RECs. There's the products on demand, or, which is still called products on demand because the name doesn't change officially until 10.9, but at 10.9, this will change to custom chart builder. And this is just the straight maritime chart service. There's bathymetric services and many other applications there as well. So I encourage you to go to this page and check out these applications. Um, as I mentioned, here's the link for that. We also have, these used to be called GeoNet pages, but now it's called the Maritime Esri Community. And so we have a page there where we blog, um, we provide links to videos. So if I would also encourage you to go there. We have you can ask questions on that community page, and if you we will always be posting about what webinars we're doing there. So um, that's a good link to have as well. And if you want to contact us directly, you can at maritime at esri.com. So I'd like to thank you all for attending today, and with that, I will turn it over to my colleague uh, Steve. Thanks, Craig. Um... Yeah, we have uh, quite a few questions here today, Craig. Uh, I'm gonna okay. try to uh, bring out a couple of these. Uh, the first question question I have is, custom chart builder available for 10.8.1? Yes, but it's called pod or products on demand at 10.8.1. But yes, it is available at I think all the way back to probably 10.5 or something like that. Okay. Um, the next question I have, um, can you explain about connecting the databases you mentioned with other ArcGIS software packages? Um, it is a geo database. So it, it inherently connects to other software packages. So if you wanted to do something, for example, like bring <clears throat> S57 data into a geo database and maybe take the nav aids and publish them as a feature service, you can do all of that. Any capability you get out of it being in a geo database, which is basically the platform, the entire uh, ArcGIS platform. So yeah, it plugs right into just about anything. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. What type of data is actually being imported into the program? Example is XYZ, dot shape, et cetera. Sure, and, and I guess maybe it's sort of a si similar answer. Um, it is a geo database. We have special tools for importing S57 data, but you just like you can bring shape files, copy features from a shape file, into a geo database, you could do that here. Um, you can take XYZ and write XYZ to point. So you could also bring XYZ data into it. 
So again, it's it is a it's a geo database. It has specialized tools for SFT7 data because we know that structure. We're in maritime, we deal with that a lot. But literally, you could put any data source that can go into a geo database can go into this database. I hope I'm answering these questions uh, as as they're meant to be, <laughs> as they were asked. Okay, no no worries. Um, okay, the the last question I have is. Can you elaborate and share the future plans for ArcGIS Maritime Bathymetry and ArcGIS Pro? Um, we also have a webinar coming up on that. That's in December. But yes. Craig, can you talk a little bit about uh, the future plans for that product? Yeah. So there are only a couple of tools currently for bathymetry in Pro. Uh, one of them is, gosh, I'm going to forget them off the top. Oh, one of them is a sounding selection tool that does like a shallow bias sounding selection. And the other one does a smoothing, uh, shallow bias smoothing of, of tin data. But yes, um, we are actually starting development on some on some bathy capabilities now. So we will have more information coming. We're doing our 2.9 planning right now, even though 2.8 hasn't come out yet, because um, we're a little bit ahead on the dev team. So we're, we are doing our 2.9 planning right now, and bathy is a part of, of that planning. But I don't want to jump ahead. There will be a, a webinar later where we'll have much more accurate information um, about that product and the plans there. Okay, well, I guess we have another question here, but before we tackle that, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we've been putting resources into uh, the chat. So if you want to try the AI shipwreck demo out yourself, you can do that. Um, I'll try to also put the IHO link in there as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to take a look at some of those links as well. So um, it seems like there's a couple more questions that okay. are coming in. Um, moving to ArcGIS Pro, will we need to merge our product library, library into the NIS our product library is currently in its own SDE database. Yeah, so there is a, that's a good question and it really depends on you as a user. Uh, it depends on how much you care about the history. Uh, like if you use the history, like geo database archiving and history, perhaps for litigation purposes, uh, like a hydrographic office might, then we have a migration script. <laughs> And that migration script will take the information from your product library and it will migrate it to new tables in that are in uh, the schema in ArcGIS Pro. So yeah, we have a so if you want to contact us, if you have a specific question about doing that or how you want to do that, I would recommend contacting us at maritime at esri.com and we can work with you and your regional distributor to help you get, you know, use this script. It's not something we put in the box because we feel like you know, it's a conversation first to determine if people want to migrate or stand up a new database and bring in their ENCs that way. Um, but yes, there is a migration script that will migrate information from the product library to your current NIS. So you don't have to, you don't have to start a new NIS if you don't want to. Okay, we have uh, another question, Craig. Okay. Uh, will you release generate depth areas and batch copy paste this year? We will release both of them this year and batch copy paste is actually in the May release. So batch copy paste is going to be in this very next upcoming release. And then uh, generate depth areas is, in fact, it's being worked on now for the 2.9 release. So it's the top priority for 2.9 which will be released in the fall, well, in the autumn. So like Q3-ish, Q3, Q4 timeline, but yes, this year. Great, um, well, that kind of wraps it up, Craig, as far as the questions. So okay. um, I'll leave it up, up to you to close it out. Okay, great. Yeah, and if you have more questions, please don't hesitate to ask. We'll We'll uh, get them answered and, and get the responses back to you if you have if you have more questions. But 
Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. And I believe as Kelly said at the top, this will be recorded and it'll be posted on Esri's channel. Um, so you can find it there if you wanna go back and look at it later. Thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.